Hello, I'm Lincoln Schatz. And I'm Joe Reinstein. Lincoln and I are so excited to welcome you to this year's Darkroom Benefit for the Museum of Contemporary Photography. We'll keep this super brief, but we wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our sponsors for tonight's event, including corporate sponsors, Kirkland and Ellis, Project Management Advisors, Seaberg Picture Framing, Related, William Blair, Sotheby's, Icon, and media sponsor, Chicago Gallery News. We are so thrilled to be supporting the museum and its mission to generate ideas and provoke dialogue among students, artists, diverse communities through groundbreaking exhibitions and programming. The museum plays a critical role in helping to cultivate a deeper understanding of the artistic, cultural, and political roles of photography in our world today. Thanks, Joe. We also want to acknowledge all the hard work of the broader MOCP team, including its professional staff, undergrad and graduate student workers, and the many volunteers who have helped make this event such a success. Like Joe, I'm honored to be involved with the MOCP and excited to be part of its dynamic and relevant mission. Joe and I have been supporters of the MOCP and have enjoyed our work on the Benefit Committee. We continue to be impressed by the vision and momentum the Executive Director Natasha Egan and Chief Curator Karen Irvine bring to the museum. Under their leadership, the MOCP has developed into one of the leading and most forward-thinking photography museums in the country. Last but not least, I'd like to thank each and all of you for your support of the MOCP, your virtual attendance from all over the globe, and hopefully active bidding on our auction items helps ensure that the MOCP continue its important work and remain a key cultural gem for the city of Chicago. Woo! Lincoln. Joe. Will you join me? I would love to, a toast to the MOCP. Yep. Making it to 45. Exactly. Our age, perfect. Yep, and providing the social lubrication we need to bid like crazy. Cheers. Cheers, happy, happy birthday University. MOCP and happy bidding. Many thanks to Joe Reinstein and Lincoln Schatz for being our fearless darkroom co-chairs for the MOCP's 45th anniversary party. And to the entire benefit committee, to each of our sponsors and the artists and galleries who have so generously donated the amazing artwork for you all to bid on tonight. My name is Natasha Egan and I am the extremely proud director of the Museum of Contemporary Photography here at Columbia College Chicago. For those of you new to the MOCP and Columbia, a warm welcome to you tonight. Columbia is an undergraduate and graduate institution providing a comprehensive educational opportunity in the arts and communications. Our intent is to educate students who will communicate creatively and who will author the culture of their times. The MOCP is one of Columbia's gems, serving as a hub for generating ideas and provoking dialogue through our groundbreaking exhibitions, renowned permanent collection of over 16,000 works, and through our robust educational programming. With an international reputation, the MOCP has grounded the corner of Harrison and Michigan Avenue in Chicago for the last 45 years, producing work that cultivates a deeper understanding of the artistic, cultural, and political roles of photography in our world today. Here's a short video introducing you to what the MOCP is all about. It's amazing what can happen in society and ways that people can begin to transform society when they take moments to reflect. And I think having a contemporary space like this look at photography gives us opportunities to really stop and reflect on present moments. We are an academic art museum and our number one mission is to teach from our collection. The museum really focuses on emerging art um, and art that's talking about what's happening in the world today. The artists are always uh, interpreting the times that we're living in and, and working at a contemporary photography museum. You're seeing artists respond to events happening in the world in real time. This past year, some of the exhibits have really touched right on the pulse of Chicago. 
And all of it was very meaningful, I think, to the time, to the moment of the time, to the way the city has been kind of reacting to COVID-19, to inequity, to um, just being locked down and needing to care for ourselves and care for each other. As an educator, when I speak with students and talk about representation in museums around the world, but also in this country, how women are quite often grossly underrepresented, even if they're prolific, how artists of color are oftentimes really underrepresented, even if they're prolific. And that's actually not the case at MOCB exhibitions. We take a lot of risk at the museum to show new, bold work. Here at this museum, we really pride ourselves in all of our programming being free, as being a welcoming staff and environment, and really encouraging students to share what they see in the images rather than us tell students what to see in the images. So many people have now understood that photography has been democratized in a way. The ways that we access images now, everyone is a photographer and carrying a camera in their pocket. So it's um, more fun, I think, to have the conversations now with students because they're thinking about photography in different ways. So to be able to work with photographers working right now and bring them into the collection and then immediately start teaching from those objects is a privilege that I feel like not a lot of museums have. And hopefully it inspires new generations of artists and activists to really think about the ways that they can use photography to share their message of change in the world. You know, I think sometimes there are different trends in contemporary art appreciation, and that's wonderful. But the thing about MOCP is that it's not trendy in that way. And it's been doing the work and will continue to do the work. I think they've done a fantastic job of maintaining a presence that's been incredibly important on our campus and in our community. And I'm incredibly proud of them and thankful for that continuing effort. We're a place that is gonna constantly evolve as the medium evolves. To capture this, the change in technology, the change in the world, the change in how society views our visual culture, this is who we are and we will always be here for them. Tonight we are here to raise the much needed funds to support the great work produced at the MOCP. Many thanks to each of you for tuning in from around the world. Your presence and support is deeply appreciated. Please consider donating throughout the evening by scanning your phone over the QR code appearing on the screen or by visiting mocp.org. Now for the fun stuff. Let's talk about art. My colleagues Karen Irvine, Chief Curator and Deputy Director, and Kristen Taylor, Curator of Academic Programs and Collections, will discuss some of the auction highlights with our co-chairs Joe and Lincoln, and we'll also have a chance to hear from a selection of artists. But before we get started, a quick word from Gary Metzger, Head of Celebes Chicago, and a dear friend of the museums. Thank you so much, Natasha, and it is great to be here. I am the super fan for MOCP. It is one of the great museums in this country, and I'm so glad you're all here supporting the auction. Sotheby's is so honored to be presenting it, and I know everyone's been following it and bidding. There's some great bidding going on, but you still have an opportunity. Look, I've got my gavel with me. You're all gonna bid until June 11th at four o'clock. So uh, you're in for a treat. We've got a lot more coming up on this great virtual program. Um, online, Sotheby's has pivoted to so many exciting online auctions, and now is your opportunity to support this incredible museum. So thank you so much, enjoy, and uh, keep bidding.
Hi, Karen. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Cheers. Cheers. So good to see you. It's good to see you too. Thanks so for... we have a personal connection. I think you know my wife, Hannah Higgins. I do. I studied with Hannah at UIC, getting my master's in art history. It's fantastic. Really nice. So you clearly know a lot more about <laughs> this artwork and all of the artwork. Um, can you tell me something? Who, who is the artist? This piece is by Sunju Kim, who's a South Korean artist, and he's looking at places in Seoul where people go for leisure. It's so crazy. There's like this wild nature behind, but they're just all like <laughs> compressed into this space. And I'm feeling like in a pre-COVID world, in a post-COVID world, this has so many, such a dramatically <laughs> different meaning. I mean, it, it, part of me is like, I can't wait to be able to go back and live this life. But at the other time, uh, uh, extreme, I'm like, oh my God, I, no one's wearing a mask. And no, I don't want to be that close to people. So when was it done? And how does the right, meaning change right. over time? Well, it is a pre-pandemic image. It was taken in 2017, but we bought it last year at the height of the pandemic. And it definitely resonated with us for all of those reasons you just cited. And when we presented it to our board, it's really, it was a very powerful um, piece at that moment for us. Well, to I'm think looking about. forward to the world when we can ride elevators together <laughs> and we can be in tight spaces and, and we can be and... at this benefit auction all in a room, all oh, drinking too. and me bidding too. on these incredible works. Um, so let's take a yeah. little stroll. Tell yeah. me about some other of these works. Right. Um, and you're the expert on this piece, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not the expert, but I was in the White House at this time. And if you look really closely, you can see my <laughs> But no, I'm just kidding. I was not in the Oval Office during this moment, but this is uh, by Pete Souza, who was the official White House photographer in the Obama administration, but also in the Reagan administration. Wow. Um, I don't know if you saw um, his documentary film where he, he mm -hmm. the way I see it, where he had both his Reagan years and his Obama mm -hmm. years, and he really was talking about the importance of the office and what it means to be presidential. And even though these presidents could be on the you know, opposite ends of the political spectrum, mm. they understood um, the importance of the office and, and how they served the American people. But this piece, this is a departure photo. Uh, when, when your service is over, when you're leaving the White House or the executive branch, um, you get to say goodbye to the president. The president gets to meet your family. And so nice. this is Carlton, Philadelphia and his family. He was in the National Security Council for a number of years and this is this is 2009 first term beginning of the first year and um, having an african-american president is just it was it's so meaningful to the country and and the president immediately likes to respond and and talk to the kids like i've just given him three and a half years of my life i haven't seen my family in years and we're in the oval office and all he wants to do is talk to my kids which is wonderful and so in this instance and they can touch him right he's he's talking to his his kids and this is jacob philadelphia jacob says you know do, do you have hair like mine and you know to to be a, a young person of color in this country mm -hmm. and to suddenly realize you have unlimited possibility um, in a world where that was just not true until this presidency right. um, and in many ways is still not true in so many ways mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but so he asked the question the president leaned over and said you know check it out check it out <laughs> and 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 he was a little scared to touch it and the president's like dude touch it and he touched it and Pete was there at that just that perfect Aww. moment uh, and it's so exciting that it's part of, of the auction. And um, uh, it just obviously means a lot to me personally, but um, it should mean a lot to actually any American. Yes. Um, so oh, it's thank beautiful. you, Pete Souza, who, who uh, obviously donated the work for the auction, mm -hmm. but is also on our benefit committee. Yeah. Uh, and so that's super exciting.
And this is an amazing piece by Brian Ulrich, who is a Columbia College Chicago grad and used to work at MOCP. And he sent in a video to tell us more about it. My name is Brian Ulrich and the piece that I donated to the MOCP benefit auction is titled Elise Beach, Florida 2015. Uh, the photograph of Elise Beach is from a larger project called The Centurion. Um, the Centurion will be published um, by FW Books from Amsterdam later this year. Um, this is a project I've been working on since 2012 and excited to see it come to fruition. This is the cover of the forthcoming book. And really the Centurion is based on and takes its name from the long kind of fabled story of the American Express black card. Um, there were, going back to the mid eighties, rumors that there was an ultra secret um, credit card that would kind of open up the pantheons of wealth and privilege to whoever hold, held the card. Um, I love this kind of idea, and that was like the crux of my investigation into this project and into the world of kind of luxury and mythology. What I like about Elise Beach is it's one of those points where we see a break or a fissure in the illusions that are created around us to kind of su suggest that we're living in some kind of paradise um, experience. Um, the piece is 32 by 40 in edition 105 and an archival inkjet print. So Lincoln, thank you so much for being on our benefit committee and also donating this beautiful print to our auction. Can you tell us a little bit about this photograph you made? Absolutely, thank you. And it's, it's, I love the MOCP, so it's <laughs> wonderful to be able to support the MOCP in any way that I can. This is uh, part of a larger series of works I've been doing in the American West, looking at uh, the narratives that we have or that I have and how they differ from the experience of that landscape. I'm reminded of the Seaman Shama quote that landscapes are culture before their nature. I mean, we kind of project our stories and our narratives onto them. Uh, and here I wanted to scratch away and explore what those narratives are and how they differ from the experience of being there, what I found. And so this is Southeast Wyoming. It's a very unusual landscape where there's like a very thin covering of soil over predominantly rocky terrain. And it's almost as if they're kind of like pushing 
out of the soil. In the back, you have the high tension lines coming through. So it's really this, um, it, it's this coexistence, this dichotomy between these two of kind of like uh, human intervention and nature uh, in this very rugged, rocky uh, landscape. And um, it's being in this landscape and spending time in landscape like this that really makes me love Vicky's work. Can we go take a look at that one? Yeah. Okay, cool. People may also know her as Victoria Sumbanderis. Um, tell me about why you like her work so much. Well, there's so many reasons. I think with a lot of these, there's, um, there's a formal component to it, which I, I really respond to in the way that it's uh, framed, the way it's set up, the way it's composed. And, and then kind of beyond that, this heavy intersection between uh, human and particularly the uh, ideas of progress uh, as evidenced in a lot of them by transit and kind of the way we move goods around against this very rugged landscape. And I think what I really respond to in hers a lot too is the way she's got these transit lines. And it reminds me of kind of like the way in which um, the West was explored and then it was canonized. Mm -hmm. And these really feel like these roads into which for better and for worse exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she does such a great thing and you have it also in yours with the power lines still in your photograph of showing sort of humans and nature in sort of this limbo and you're not sure which part to look at first, um, like the manufactured landscape or the natural. And it reminds me a little bit of why I like this artist so much. Um, Eric Johnson is another artist in our collect or in, in the auction this year. And this piece is so great to see in person. It's a little hard to tell on screen, but he also is making a lot of work about the human imprint on nature. It's sort of these marks that we leave showing our presence. Um, so this is a photograph of tree carvings, a series that he did where people have carved things into trees. And if you look at it closely, you can say it says, we were here. Um, and he's photographing at night with certain um, different sources of light, like firecrackers or fireflies and different alternative light sources. So we have this nice blue tint to the image. Um, but I love it too, because it just sort of talks about this, this primal need we have to mark our territory and show that we were at a place mm -hmm. and, and to preserve that. And so it's, it's all the way back to referencing even the original cave paintings is something that he was thinking about in making this series. So I really love that this is part of the auction and that we can see it in person right now. <laughs> well, the human imprint on nature is actually, and I, I'll take that much further along. Here we go, let's look at this one. So, Bob Fall's piece there, I mean, I don't think there's any nature in there. Maybe, there may be a weed down here somewhere, <laughs> but it's almost like, this is kind of like taking that extreme, that human imprint on nature, the human kind of overtaking and kind of, to a certain extent, uh, with mine, with certainly with uh, Vicky's work, it's just kind of like, it's, it's like, this is the full blown uh, result of all this. And I, I love this for a bunch of reasons. There's the formal quality, there is the black at me, it's just an exquisitely toned image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and having had grown up in the city, I remember this city. I remember the grittiness and it was just, it was, it was a different place. So I have a tremendous nostalgia mm -hmm. for this era as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob Thal's images are so crisp and beautiful in person because he's using a view camera, which just captures so much detail and has such a large negative. And there's another artist that I love um, in the auction who works in view camera a lot. And I'm gonna tell you about him because a lot of people don't know him yet. This is the piece by Peter Cochran. He just recently graduated with his MFA. Um, but in this piece, he is camouflaging himself and he's covered himself entirely in tin foil and an environment covered in tin foil. And the image is, was made inspired by images he saw of Pompeii where bodies were preserved in ash. And you have these kind of like stone-like sculptures um, of figures who died in the volcano in Pompeii. Um, but he's making it about more like queer survival techniques and sort of the history of surviving um, as a queer individual and having to camouflage yourself within environments to kind of um, uh, be safe within them. And so um, him adding this red tint to the image is something that I think also that elevates it into this other place too, that it's, it's just far more emotional and it's called From Blood to Lust. So I really love this mm. artist and I think he's definitely someone to follow. It's beautiful. It's interesting thinking about this idea of reflection as a means mm -hmm. of camouflage mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, what gets reflected, how that changes meaning. And we were looking at this piece mm -hmm. uh, earlier, which is just so delicate and mm -hmm. so beautiful. Can I, I don't want to break it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a shame that we're all celebrating right now virtually because when you see this in person, this is a real daguerreotype. And mm -hmm. if you've ever seen a daguerreotype before, have you seen one before? I have. Yeah. yeah. It's, such a, it's such a treat and a lot of people haven't seen them, but they, they're reflective by nature. So you can see yourself within the image. 
which is part of the artist's concept too. So he sent us a video, Ben Don, where he describes his process and his choice of materials that we're going to watch now. There's a hillside in the Bay Area called the Lafayette Hillside Memorial where community members place crosses and other religious symbols to represent their loved ones who die in the ongoing war in the Middle East. Making daguerreotypes of this place allows me to participate in the act of remembrance in a personal way. What are my responsibilities as an American citizen in these wars? How do we honor these families who carried the burdens of war? How can photographs help us to remember and honor the loss of these American heroes? Seeing ourselves as part of this story remind us about the cost of human lives when we as a nation, send our loved ones into war. And we have a few other videos by artists that they've sent us describing their pieces. One is by one of my favorite artists, Carmen Winant, who's part of our exhibition right now, Reproductive Health Fertility Agency. So she sent us a video describing this piece. It is a great honor and privilege to be um, participating in the benefit um, and to be sharing this work, which is for me, very special one. I made this piece as a part of a series in 2016. Um, the larger series is called The Red Parts and each 9 by 12 sheet is unique um, and each is hand dyed with red food coloring. So there are a series of red food coloring baths, three or four, um, that each sheet and each image passed through. Um, the images themselves are from a found book um, of, or series of books really, of a method of self-healing called Do In Practique, which is sort of a French take on shiatsu. And what I really loved about the images um, were the ways in which they projected um, not only methods of self-healing, but self-healing through touch. Um, effectively, ways in which one could touch their own body to sort of um, release tension or heal from trauma. And so each uh, image that appears is, in other words, unique. Um, and so much as, as found photographs can be unique objects in the world, each is hand dyed um, in this sort of deep red food coloring bath. Um, and it's, there's sort of variations in redness in accordance with how much it's been dyed or how many um, dye baths it's moved through. Um, and it exists in this sense as, um, as sort of somewhere between the reproduced and reproducible and the profoundly unique, not only for the ways in which I've found and cut up found objects, but for how I've treated the objects and how I've touched them and how, I've, how they've come in contact with my own body. Um, as it has thought about, um, as I've thought about its sort of capabilities um, in sort of making and healing as intrinsically related to one another. Thank you. So Lincoln, I know you're also a fan of Clarissa Bonet's work. Tell us about why you like her so much. Um, I am a fan of her work and I'm a fan of this entire body of work uh, here in Chicago. There is the formal composition of them, which I really respond to, this axonometric view down into these um, streetscapes, and not all of them are that way. It's just framing the lighting. She, she creates this like magical, mysterious, other world within the confines of Chicago. And there's this graphic quality to it as well, where I can, I, I, I understand it certainly in three dimensions, and if I squint a little bit, it just becomes this beautifully alive, dynamic graphic surface. She's wonderful, and based here in Chicago, a lot of the, all of this work is about Chicago too, which is something so special. So she sent us a video telling us about this piece also, which I'm excited to see. My name is Clarissa Bonet. I'm an artist living and working in Chicago. The piece I donated for Dark Room is titled Sweeping Traces, and it's part of a larger body of work titled City Space. The project City Space really investigates the pedestrian experience of the city center, contemplating ideas surrounding anonymity, um, surveillance, urban planning, and the divide between public and private space. Uh, with this particular picture, um, Sweeping Traces, at the time I made it, I was really interested in investigating 
uh, mark making and um, looking at the landscape and thinking a lot about the traces of anonymous individuals and how they often leave marks behind in the landscape and their presence can be felt even though they may not be physically present. So with this particular picture, Sweeping Traces, um, you see one lone figure, but he's set against the backdrop of potentially hundreds or thousands of people when you really investigate the space. So if you look at the sidewalk, there is little dots of gum that kind of litter the, the backdrop of the sidewalk. So that gum um, is a trace or a representation of an individual in the space. And then layered on top of that, thinking a lot about the hundreds of people that moved through that space that then turned that gum kind of a black color. Um, and then again, looking again deeper at the landscape, you see these kind of scratches or drag marks across the ground. And I'm always curious and I always wonder what happened there, who left those behind and what were they moving um, to leave something like that behind. And then lastly, you have the lone figure who's sweeping up trash and garbage as another representation of somebody in the landscape. So although this picture, Sweeping Traces, only pictures one physical person, the landscape evokes hundreds, if not thousands of others when we really investigate the surface of the city. Kristen, mm -hmm. tell me about this. Is this, this is like a very quixotic work. Mm -hmm. It is, and I love this artist. So I recently had the privilege of doing a virtual studio visit with her. This is Tabitha Soren's work. She's an artist based in San Francisco. My favorite parts about seeing it in person is you can see all the little fingerprints. So there, it's a photograph of an iPad screen with mm -hmm. an image underneath, and it's called surface tension. So she's. She's making a comment on, on the ways we spend our time looking at images on media devices and sort of quickly scrolling through them. And underneath is the image of a wildfire. Um, so a lot of times the images underneath are about um, important events happening in the news and sort of our inability to apps actually connect and, and sort of um, feel like that's real because we're looking at it through a screen all the time.
25th anniversary MOCP. I am Mark Kelly, I'm the Commissioner for Cultural Affairs and Special Events for the City of Chicago, and I'm just thrilled that we have here in Chicago one of the world's greatest academic art museums uh, dedicated to photography. What a gift to the city, what a gift to the world. I feel like I grew up with MOCP with my long association with Columbia, and I'm just thrilled to join you today for this special anniversary. Again, many thanks to each of you for joining Darkroom 2021 and for your generous support through your sponsorships, donations, and bidding on the fabulous artwork. As a reminder, the auction closes on June 11th at 4 p.m. Central Time, but you may always donate at mocp.org. This concludes the program portion of Darkroom, and I now invite you to switch platforms to your wonder.me link in your registration email and join us for a lively cocktail party where I encourage you each to move around the room meeting artists and photography enthusiasts from around the world. Thank you so much.